This is a memory plane that I snuck out of our laboratory at MIT years and years and years ago. I was a member, as a, as a young graduate student, as a, as a beginner, I was a member of a, of a group developing the magnetic core memory. We did. The, the leader of our group was a man named Bill Papian. And w one of the key persons in that group was a man named Ken Olson, who was later the founder of a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC. And several, several of the guys in the group uh, left with Ken Olson to form DEC. This, this was the first random access memory, RAM, that was practical, reliable, and quite high speed. And the time that it took with this memory to request information and then get the information from the memory was of the order of a microsecond. And if you don't know what that is, that's a millionth of a second. It's, it's th thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of times slower than memory today. When we were working on this, in a million years, we couldn't have imagined what happened with memory. This all had to be hand-wired. All, all the wiring in this memory plane was done by a, a woman who was a technician working in the lab. Her, I don't remember her last name, but her, her first name was Hilda, H-I-L-D-A. And Hilda wound all these memory planes. It's like knitting. You can see, you can see the contacts. This connects to all the wires that go, th go through the memory plane. And here, exactly. So this, this was a single memory plane, and you have many of these memory planes stacked one on top of the other. So if, if the memory was a 16-bit memory, you'd have 18 of these. They'd have 16 bits for storage, and then two extra bits for parity checking, that would allow you to do memory checking. The machine that we put this in was Whirlwind. Whirlwind was a handmade machine that we worked on at MIT back, back in the late 50s and 60s. Pieces of the machine today are in the Smithsonian. At that time, all, all the computers in the world were all handmade, and I think that there were approximately six computers in the whole world, all handmade. This became very, very reliable. The storage is magnetic, and each each of the little black toroids, little they're like little little tires on a car. H Hilda did all did w wove all those wires. It's like weaving, and the number of little cores that are here on this plane, I believe, are 4,096. So this, this thing can store 4,096 bits. So today that's nothing. But then, that, that was incredible. Each, each of these little black toroids, each one stored one bit. You can actually see how the bits are stored. Today on a memory chip, if you want to see how the bits are stored, you need a very high-powered microscope. It was called electrostatic storage. And you start doing computations with the computer, and every couple of hours you get a memory alarm. If that, if that happens, then you know that, that there's a mistake in getting something out of memory and the calculations that you did over the last couple of hours become suspect. You have to throw it away and start all over again. So it, they would be getting memory alarms at Whirlwind every, every couple of hours on average. With uh, this memory we installed in Whirlwind, you'd get a memory alarm maybe once every couple of months. So you'd be able to calculate with the computer for months, months at a time, and do significant computation without having to worry, uh, is, is there a memory error? Do I have, do I have some bad data? This, this, this was a huge breakthrough. This thing is what made 
the digital computer practical. And I was a young kid when we worked on this. This was quite a quite an amazing thing for me. And I tried to explain to my father that this thing can do do arithmetic and add add two numbers together in a few millionths of a second. You know, and it's it's hard to describe to somebody. And he says, "What's the hurry? Why do you have to go so fast?" <laughs> Uh, we, we were concerned about a, a Soviet attack on, on the United States. We were concerned about Soviet bombers coming to the United States. And we had radar with presenting real-time radar signals into the computer. And the purpose of it was for tracking, tracking Soviet aircraft. That was the excuse for building the computer. It was not long after this was developed that the, the government um, set out for bid computer makers, there were several of them, to make computers for air defense centers for the United States. I think there were going to be something like 20 air defense centers all over the country. IBM won the contract. That's what IBM was making some pretty crude computers. They, they were doing a lot with punch cards and punch card machines and key punches and all this mechanical stuff. And they were very good at that. And then they, they got this technology, lock, stock, and barrel. So they came into our lab. They, they, they took my lab notebook. I spent a, a week or so with IBM engineer explaining to him all the ins and outs, all the details of how, how this thing works. The next thing I saw was several years later, the IBM 701 computer had this memory in it. That was, uh, today you call these kinds of things mainframes. Of course, what was in that 701 computer, you can put a thousand of them in a wristwatch today. There it took up a whole half of a building. The other half of the building was the air conditioning. So that, that's how it became commercialized.